Here's a question from Claudio, who uh, is objecting to the Trinity. So we're dealing with a other than believer. Let's make sure we clarify that. But they would make the claim that, of course, this Trinity doctrine was unknown to Jesus. No third helper or God person exists. Okay, so the objection isn't to the deity of Christ or the deity of the Father. The objection is to the Holy Spirit being deity. It was not understood, this is him, that the Holy Spirit is none other than the Father, who is, quote, a spirit. God is a spirit, John 4, 23 through 24. You can figure it out from the verse on the two blasphemies, where, quote, that spirit who is the Father is called Holy Spirit by Jesus. Only the Father who is a spirit, a.k.a. Holy Spirit, is with Jesus. So, applying our rhetoric here, the claim is the Holy Spirit is in reference to the Father, because according to John chapter 4 and verse 23, and it's good he gave verse citation for this, so he regards Scripture, that God is Spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So Jesus speaking, making a reference to God, says God is Spirit. Since he is flesh, he's obviously referring to the other person of, I guess, his Claudia's dual entity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is, Binity. of course, God. Yeah, yeah Binity, <laughs> that would be it. But um, utter denial of the Holy Spirit as God, that the Trinity is a, quote, conventional doctrine, that it doesn't exist. So um, we can deal with this point by point. I reached out to Claudio, for those of you listening, to clarify what he meant by the passage of the two blasphemies. I don't know what that is. But uh, regarding our reasons for the Holy Spirit being distinct from the Father and the Son— what would, first of all, the Trinity mean? And then we'll go from there. Why do we think the Holy Spirit's a part of that and is, in fact, a person, as opposed to, as Jehovah's Witnesses would claim, an active force, or as uh, Unitarians would say, just, you know, God acting in another way? Yeah, no, it's a, it is an interesting question, and it is uh, a much more difficult contention than people who point out that, I mean, or try to point out that Jesus is never called God within the New Testament, which is actually very easy to prove. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the most humble <laughs> member of the Trinity. His job, his mission is actually to reveal or make known or clarify the existence of the Son and the Father. So you'd expect him to be a little bit more uh, anonymous within the scriptures. And sometimes actually when you're reading the scriptures, you could just kind of pass over the instances in which the Holy Spirit is singled out, that it is him doing something as opposed to the Father or the Son. Uh, and I'll point out a couple of those right now. But essentially what the doctrine of the Trinity is, is that we as Christians believe in one single God. We are monotheists, right? So fact number one, how many gods are there? If you say there's a being out there rightly referred to as God, the <clears throat> ultimate power, that would numerically amount to one. one. All right, so first fundamental doctrine of the Trinity, there is one God. Right. Not three, not ten, <laughs> right. one. Just one God. And that one God, since he created all time, matter, and space, is spirit. So you are right about that. God, to his essence and his nature, would have to be spiritual because he couldn't be material. He created all of matter, time, and space, right? You have to be made of the things you invented. Right. That, <laughs> it doesn't make much sense. So God would obviously have to be separate from his creative work. Therefore, he is spiritual. That's the word we have for it, an immaterial pure conscious being that is able to create through his spoken word, right? There, there are things that only God can truthfully say about himself. That's right. So now within that one being of God, we say that there are multiple consciousness within that. So you could say multiple persons or multiple centers of consciousness. Uh, there are various ways that people allude to it. But regardless, what we're saying is we're making a distinction between what we would call being and personhood, right? So a being is just any being, right? I could point out, I could say like, well, cats are a type of being, dogs are a type of being, grasshoppers are a type of being, and that humans- is what they are. That's right. Humans are a type of being. But only a, a weirdo would say that a cricket is a person, right? It is a being, true, no one's going to dispute you on that. It is a living being, as a matter of fact, but it is not a person. It doesn't have rights of a person. Its consciousness is much far below what a human being is capable of, right? It, it's just not going to be rise to the level of what we would call personhood. It's a being, but it's not a person. And right? even if you go to, like, Hopper from The Bug's Life, that is one being with one person. Right. The person is 
who they are, right. their identity. That's right. So that that identity or that singularity of consciousness, that uniqueness of being that we're talking about, that's what we ascribe to as person, right? So that's a person. So what am I? I am a human being. Who am I? I am Peter. That's the person I am. Not the same thing. So if we say God is one in being and three in being, that'd be a problem. If we say right. one in person, three in person, that's a problem. If we say one in being, three in person, those are two different categories. It's unique. Right. But it's not illogical. That's right. So because God is created in a very unique way, we don't see He's that. He's not created. Well, <laughs> God's not created. No, no, no. Since God has created. Okay. Right. Since God has created in a very particular Heresy way. Check. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that means that we don't really see things on this plane of existence that mimic God. So in our way of thinking, in our reality, there are no beings that are comprised of multiple persons, right? Uh, some people would be like, well, it's kind of like multiple personality disorder. No, no, it's not, right? No, it's not. It's actually nothing like that, right? So it is something that is really unique, and we take it on faith. So Christians have utilized the word Trinity to compound or to crystallize or to focus this really complicated center of theology that we have come to that conclusion through the reading of texts of Scripture, right? So, uh, and by the way, this is just how the Bible is written. The Bible doesn't have really clear, definitive places where it just lays out long doctrines of theology. The Bible has theology sprinkled through it, and you have to read the whole thing and put it together and figure out how these things harmonize before you can come to a conclusion, right? So all these things that I'm saying, there are dozens and dozens of passages backing up what I'm saying, right? There's no one passage that says, and God is one in being and three in person. No, <laughs> These we, are the, that would be nice, but that's not how the Bible is organized for us, right? That's I not have how to, we come up with anything we believe from the Bible. We right. get a series of true statements and come to a conclusion based on them. The term Trinity was a word used to describe what is obviously taking place there, but we have to come to that conclusion if we're saying that God is one and three. What sense? What way? Well, that's the whole point why we make the distinction, because right. the Bible the Bible's very clear about monotheism, Deuteronomy mm -hmm. 6, 4, for example, and the New Testament affirms this as well, John 17, 3, for instance. But if on the era, I'll note that in a moment, but they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. But if on the other hand we ask, okay, so Jesus then goes on to claim God's his Father, and at the same time that he has rights, that he has duties, that he has basically power that only belongs to that one true God. And on top of that, that he's going to send another, who by the way is not the Father, otherwise he could have just said that, who would also share those prerogatives. Right, so for this purpose, for this person that we're talking to, we actually don't need to prove the deity of the Son or the Father, because he hasn't yeah. contested them. So but the all we need to prove persons, yeah. is that there is a distinction of persons. So there are actually several passages that we can go to, as Sean alluded to one of them already, uh, where we could see that there is a distinction in persons, that the both the Father and the Son make these distinctions. There's one of my favorites, which is in the Old Testament, Isaiah 48, verse 16, which uh, I'm sure John would like to quote because I know he likes that one as well. Uh, but this Talk is, to Muslims a lot. <laughs> yeah, this is John chapter 14. <clears throat> and in John chapter 14, Jesus says, uh, verse 16, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that you he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you a little while longer, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I live, you will also live. At that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them <clears throat> is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father also, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Then a couple of verses later, he says, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and he will come to him and make our home with him. And he who does not love me, nor uh, does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but my Father's who sent me. So we see a distinction of persons. Jesus mentions himself, clearly that's one person, and then he mentions the Father, and then he claims that the Father and the Son are going to separate a, uh, send another helper, right? And the word another, the preposition in Greek, is actually really, really important. He's not just saying another as in something else. Another of a same kind, right? So we're talking about something that Jesus 
sees on his level, right? Not just like an angelic being or angelic presence. Beyond that, he sees that this singular helper will be able to manifest himself to all the people in the church, right? So he's praying that this singular member of the church, this singular person is going to be able to manifest himself to everyone who believes on God after Jesus has ascended to his Father. Beyond that, he believes that by having this person's presence in your life, it is tantamount to having the presence of the Father and the Son. This seems like a divine person to me. So very clearly in this passage, the Holy Spirit is separate and distinct, and the Holy Spirit is given attributes like omnipresence, right? He has to be able to manifest himself to all the followers of Jesus throughout the ages, and he is given the title of another helper, meaning he's on the level of Jesus, and Jesus is already deity. Beyond that, having the Holy Spirit is tantamount to having the Father and the Son in your life, which again is another divine attribute. So we have distinct person and divine in nature. And also note, we want to make sure in the complete witness of Scripture, what it's revealed in the uh, new is also, <coughs> ironically, a reference to the old. And this is not something that Christians invented. This was not something that Jesus introduced, certainly clarified it a bit. But if you were to only have the Old Testament, which all the apostles did, they would have the same working information we have to understand what they spoke about. And in the book of Isaiah, chapter 48 and verse 16, I'll start in verse 12 so we know who's talking. We have God as if he is someone to be ordered around, someone who has an authority at least higher than him, if not equal to him, and also submitting to that authority. Now, in verse 12 of Isaiah 48, this is who is speaking. Listen to me, O Jacob, in Israel my called. I am. I am the first. I am also the last. Now, for those of you who are noting, that is a title exclusive to God, one that Jesus, by the way, claims for himself in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 17. It's describing his eternal nature. Indeed, my hand has laid the foundation of the earth. This is creator. And my right hand has stretched out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand up together. Jesus fulfilled that literally when calming the storm. All of you here, uh, all of you assemble yourselves in here. <clears throat> Who among them has declared these things? The Lord loves him. He shall do his pleasure on Babylon. His arm shall be against the Chaldeans. He's speaking of their return from exile. I, even I have spoken. Yes, I have called him. I have pro bought him and his way will prosper. Come near to me and hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, and from the time that it was, I was there. So remember, God's repeating his eternal nature. I've been around a long time. In fact, I've been around since before time. I'm timeless. And then he goes on to say, and now, this is Isaiah 48, verse 16, the Lord God and his spirit have sent me. Now, again, who is the me? Who is the object of this conversation? Well, someone who could claim for themselves, as we saw in 12 through 13, one who is creator, one who redeemed Israel, one who's the first and the last, so eternal, who claims that title for themselves, therefore the God of Israel. Yet the God of Israel is saying, God sent me. And not just God has sent me, but his spirit, distinguished from the Lord God, has sent God. <laughs> Keep track of this, and this is why we would come to these conclusions. But noting the Holy Spirit, even in the Old Testament, is given divine, uh, excuse me, divine, divine. <laughs> prerogatives like Job chapter 33 and verse 4, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3, and plenty others. He's called creator, he's called the maintainer and the introducer of life. We can go on, but the point of emphasis is this. If we deny the deity of the Holy Spirit, and we can also go into the New Testament for this as well, he's addressed as a person in Acts chapter 5 where in verses 2 through 3, he can be lied to and is called God by the Apostle Peter, not wrongly. We can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and noting that he knows everything. Who knows the deep things of God except the Spirit of God? We can note Jesus again in John chapter 16, noting all things the Father has are mine, and I will give them to the one I'm sending. Notice, not back to the Father, to the one I'm sending. So, all, and again, my summation, but read the passage. The point being made is this. We come to the conclusion of the Trinity not because it's conventional, not because it's 
convenient, not because it's unique, because it is the only conclusion you can come to given the full revelation of Scripture. We encourage further conversation about this, and I hope that <coughs> this is something that we can talk about agreeably. But again, if not, then understand whatever God you're worshiping, we don't believe in a bi-entity. The bi-entity can't save you because he's not there. So make sure that that is a priority, and for all of you listening, think through these things as well, because of all the cult groups out there, they will challenge this one the most. We need to understand these things because it is just that important.